Hello, everyone. We'll get started in just one moment. Letting everybody log in. All right, let's get started. This is exciting. Welcome alumni. We are so thrilled that you're joining us for our initial Alumni Advantage event series. So welcome. For those of you I've not met yet, my name is Peggy Conway. I am the new director of Neely Alumni and Constituent Engagement, but I'm not new to TCU Neely at all. I know many of you, uh, the people on the call today, I've been at Neely for many years. Um, that as Director of Graduate Admissions, but recently transitioned to this new role. And I'm really excited and looking forward to serving all of you um, and looking forward to getting to know many of you. Um, it is my pleasure to get us started today. And I'm gonna do that by introducing our, I'm gonna call him our newish Dean. And I say that because many of you have not had the chance to meet Daniel, although he's been here just a little over a year. Uh, Dean Daniel Pullen is joining us from um, his previous position was with OU, and he has been exciting um, change agent here at Neely and uh, has brought a lot of great energy to the program. So Daniel, with that, I'm gonna let you get us kicked off. All right, thank you. Thank you, Peggy. And, and thanks for everybody for uh, investing your time with us today. Um, I am always pumped to have the opportunity to engage with what I think is one of our most important constituencies, uh, that's our alumni. Um, certainly we have a forward focus on our, on our students every day, um, we have faculty and staff as we support them intellectually and professionally, um, but uh, we also recognize the really outsized importance of having deep and productive um, and aspirational connections with our alumni. If you think about all the different ways alumni can, can engage to support our progress, um, it's, it's pretty remarkable. And, um, and we're so thrilled to have an amazing leader like Peggy Conway, someone who has been responsible for recruiting so many generations of amazing students to um, our classrooms and corridors who are now, you know, assuming their rightful place as alumni, um, as the great business leaders we need uh, for the world today. Um, and so this is a great new um, evolution in our forward focus on alumni, alumni engagement, and making sure that we arm you with the, the information uh, to be um, our evangelist in the communities that you uh, circulate. Uh, we want to make sure that you have awareness of the opportunity set and the strength of our academic program so that you can um, send uh, prospective students our way. Or if you have hiring needs, either for internships or full-time uh, placements, that, uh, that we become a go-to source of talent um, as your organizations are thinking about how do you, um, uh, you know, make sure that, that talented, uh, well-prepared business professionals are on the critical path of your growth expectations. You know, certainly we want to engage you um, and help you, um, can help us convene community. So many of you might want to be a guest lecturer or uh, maybe an adjunct professor, uh, give a talk, um, you know, mentor a student, uh, provide pathways and career advice and counseling. There's so many different ways to be involved as an alum. And, and I hope that um, certainly as your opportunity um, uh, opens, that is, is, as you think about directing your philanthropic giving, that you think about the Newly School of Business as a place that's well worth investing in. And so if you have interest, not only in what we talk about today, uh, but in any of those different dimensions as to how you can engage to, to move our uh, business school forward, please contact Peggy. I know she'll be um, quite quite excited to visit with you um, and to collaborate as we really continue to advance what has become one of the great business schools in in the country and, and, and therefore the world. So um, you're all insiders and I thought that since I haven't met all of you that I would at least give you a, a glimpse as to what's been going on in the business school over the last few months, certainly last year or so since since I was fortunate enough to, to arrive here. Um, 
One of the things I found upon arrival that was just particularly distinctive is that um, this is not a business school that just says, hey, we teach some students and we do some research and maybe we have some outreach and we look like every other business school in the country. That's, that's not the case at all. Um, this is the only business school in the country that I've seen. Um, and uh, I've seen a bunch. I'm on the National Board of Business School Accreditation. So I go around the country and look at all the different um, you know, peers and competitors and, and so on. Um, this is the only business school that, uh, that I'm aware of that actually makes a brand promise to its stakeholders every day. Um, that really lives to that higher expectation, that, that guarantee, that commitment, if you will. Um, we call that promise the Neely promise, uh, which makes sense. And it's one beautiful sentence, and it's this. It is to unleash human potential with leadership at the core and innovation in our spirit. That's it, right? Um, it's about being human-centered, right? Unleashing human potential. It's about thinking of the business school, not just as a place where we trade tuition and fees for credit hours and diplomas, but as a place where we prepare the leaders that are necessary for both business as well as what business has to say about society moving forward. And then it's all about innovation, right? Unleashing our spirit of innovation. And, um, and that's exciting because we know that as, even as, as well prepared as our graduates are today, that as they become alums like you, they're going to have to have that career agility. They're gonna to have to reinvent themselves. They're gonna to have to learn how to learn because even, even if we teach them the latest and greatest, the most cutting edge skills and techniques in our classrooms today, we know that will evolve for tomorrow. So how lucky am I to work at a, at a place, to really invest my career at a place that, that cares about the real asset of an institution, the human, that thinks about um, those that we, we prepare as leaders, not just graduates and the types of leaders that can reinvent themselves to be relevant and add value to business and society throughout the entirety of their careers, right? It's a really special value proposition, uh, which you know a heck of a lot better than I do, but I just wanted to, to, to let you know how, um, how important that's been during this time. We've been innovating like crazy. We've been upgrading our world-class curriculum with lots of new experiential learning opportunities. Uh, we launched an all new Masters of Science in Business Analytics. Data analytics is a really important uh, skill set that so many of our alums and corporate partners are, are craving. So many of our students are asking for that additional level of expertise. And now we have a full graduate program to, to answer that call. Um, even in the, the, the first part of the global pandemic, we were able to uh, address the challenges of so many of our students who had job offers and internship offers pulled through no fault of their own because of the economic uncertainty of the time. We, we got on the, 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 the phone and on Zoom and um, you know, sent out carrier pigeons in any way we could, we could uh, you know, communicate with our alums and corporate partners saying, hey, hire a horn frog. We really need you now more than ever. And through those uh, collaborations and engagements like that are represented on this call today, we were able to save 150 horn frogs from not being employed upon graduation, which allowed us to maintain really our market leading graduation uh, placement rate of 97% year over year. And so through the strength of our alumni network, you know, we didn't miss a beat. You know, the same uh, career success for students graduating in 2019, as well as into the teeth of a global pandemic in 2020. So a remarkable testament of the power of our network, the alumni, the importance that we have um, in building strong, productive relationships, because ultimately it benefits our student. And so for any of you that were involved in, in saving a horn frog, helping a horn frog, um, employing a horn frog, I just wanna say, say thank you. And so speaking of partnerships, and um, the, uh, the lifelong nature of a, a relationship and affiliation with, uh, with the TCU Neely School of Business. I'm really, really excited to kick off our very first Neely Alumni Advantage series. Um, we talked a little bit about innovation, so I think it is only appropriate that we continue to unleash our spirit of innovation. Uh, today's topic is, of course, the innovation imperative. Uh, very timely and what has been certainly a, a year full of disruption. And so I am pleased to introduce our very own experts from the TCU Neely Institute of Entrepreneurship and Innovation um, and the Neely uh, Center for Executive Education today. Uh, let's just start by starting. Uh, the conversation will begin with um, our William M. Dickey Entrepreneur in Residence, uh, Michael Sherrod. Michael. Thank you, Dean Pullum. And thank you all for being here today. Uh, I think we have some really interesting things to talk to you about. I'm gonna get started right away because I think I have more slides to do in 15 minutes than has ever been done before. Uh, but 
Uh, I think you'll find it interesting. It's going to be a lot of data, but um, stick with me, and I think you'll you'll get a lot out of it. Let me just get this up and running. The innovation imperative and the exponential opportunity that comes from it. So the state of today, um, we're in a, a world of disruption. We're in a world of constant transformation. In 1931, the average lifespan of a corporation was 71 years. Today, it is 14 years. And the reason for that is because of the disruption that's created in the marketplace with these new technologies that are growing so ridiculously fast. And I'll show you some of those in a moment. Uh, corporate corporations are built or have been built in the past to create a core competency and be really good at that core competency, to get better and more efficient at it every year, create more revenue at less cost every year. That's not the case anymore. Corporations can't keep up with the rate of change and disruption is coming from everywhere, it seems, except their competitors. So that model is breaking down and it's not working. And, and when you only have 14 years to create the, the future, it's pretty hard to do while creating that core competency. And you add to that, that greater than 50% of uh, the American workforce is now on 1099s. This was supposed to happen in 2025, but COVID-19 accelerated that trend to this year. So we actually are at almost 60% of the American workforce right now on 1099s. This means that there is an imperative, an innovation imperative, an entrepreneurial imperative for both corporations and individuals. Uh, corporations are transforming. They're, they're realizing that they need more 1099 workers so they can get big fast and get small fast in order to meet the, the challenges of the marketplace. And adult Americans are realizing that some of them anyway, that they're better off doing their own thing and they don't want to work for the man, especially some of the last two generations, Generation Z and the millennials. They want to be more flexible with their lifestyle and have more balance in their life. And these 1099ers are not just students, or they're not just the lower end of the socioeconomic scale. These are MDs, CPAs, PhDs, chief marketing officers, chief uh, uh, financial officers who are on 1099s. Uh, and this is a trend that's going to continue. At the same time, we have a management crisis going on in the United States because 64% of Americans hate their jobs. 77% of Americans would forego a raise to see their boss fired. And get this one, 66% of Americans would prefer a robot for a boss than a human boss. That's kind of amazing because they feel like a, a robot could be more fair in the application of the rules of the company. They do want a human for personal things, for lifestyle things, or things where they need a paternity leave or maternity leave or whatever it may be. But for enforcing the rules, they want a robot because the robot will be fair. You add to that the fact that we distrust our institutions, all of them. When I, for the last five years, I've asked my students, both undergraduate and MBAs, what institutions, military, uh, governmental, religious, uh, secular, uh, educational, do you trust implicitly? And I get crickets. They have no answer to that. So this distrust, when you add social media crisis to that with disinformation, invasion of privacy, grabbing our data without our permission, doing things with it, we have no idea. And then put the cherry on top of COVID and the COVID-19 recession, you have a tremendous amount of disruption, more than we've seen in a long, long time where our institutions are going to have to be remade, where our companies are going to have to re be remade, where our vision of work is going to have to be remade. This is a, a turbulent area, a turbulent time. And it is, it is societal, it is political, it is economic, it is spiritual, and it's psychological. This change. We, America has been through this change many, many times. We know disruption. We know transformation. We've been through a revolution, a civil war, World War I, the Depression, World War II. And then we became the most powerful economy and country in the world. And we've been continually dealing with being that thing. And so change is something we're, we're very used to. But that means we're living in the single greatest entrepreneurial op opportunity in the history of the world. I know that seems counterintuitive, but the fact of the matter is that innovation and entrepreneurship, design thinking, strategic thinking, entrepreneurial thinking, these are beginning to catch up 
with the technological changes that are taking place. We're beginning to understand how to take advantage of all this technology and the capital to do it is, is in place. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. So when you have disruption, you have this continual trans transformation and you add the stacking of these exponential technologies, you get exponential opportunity. And here are some of those exponential technologies that provide that opportunity. Processing power continues to double every two years. Moore's law, it is still in place. It is still working. It is unbelievable the amount of, of, of processing power that we're gonna get every two years. Uh, processing efficiency has improved by orders of magnitude in the last 30 years. Quantum computing, qubits will increase by a factor of 17. I know that may not mean much, but a qubit makes com uh, quantum computing go faster than any conceivable uh, uh, regular computer we have. And when you look at this hockey stick of uh, qubits, uh, the number of qubits achieved, you can see that the level of ability to compute, the computing power is going to be unbelievable. The total amount of data globally will grow by 3x in 2025. This is why we need AI and machine learning. We can't, no human being can keep up with that. We've seen a 12x increase in internet traffic since 2010 and that is continuing to rise. For the first time in July of 2020, almost 60% of the world was using the internet. The number of Google searches has increased over 2000 times in two decades. Uh, end user connection speed has grown by a factor of 10X in just the last decade. Mobile phone usage, global penetration has passed 100%. That is a phenomenal statistic. Smartphone usage in the United States, 81% of Americans now own a smartphone. Mobile 5G subscriptions are gonna increase 11X by 2025. And I think that's a conservative estimate. Wearable devices, there will be 1 billion connected wearables by 2022. Think about that. That's like your Fitbit, 1 billion. That level of growth is unprecedented. VR and AR headsets, global shipments are gonna increase by 10X by 2024. Battery technology, global demand is gonna increase by 17X by 2024. DRAM memory chips, 100 billion more units shipped by 2023. That's dynamic random access memory and that goes into everything that computes. That means the amount of computing that's gonna be happening both in the quantum world and in the program world is gonna be basically unbelievable. Global inventory of electrical vehicles has increased sevenfold just in the last five years. Renewable energy, 20X solar energy generation. Just look at that from about 2009, well, 2010, 33.7 gigawatts to 2019, 724 gigawatts. And it's continuing to rise with hockey stick style growth. Global e-commerce sales will reach nearly 7 trillion in 2023. They were through 3.2 trillion uh, just last year and in, in, uh, in two years, a year and a half, they're gonna be almost $7 trillion. Again, I think that's low because COVID has accelerated the growth of e-commerce dramatically. It'll probably be closer to eight. Industrial robotics, global shipments are up nearly six or five X since 2010. 3D printing has doubled in three years. Scientific research, there's been a 45 X increase in CRISPR related publications and sequencing the human genome the cost has fallen 100,000 times in 20 years. Mind boggling stat. So these are exponential opportunities. This is what they mean. And over the next decade, these uh, exponential opportunities are gonna be stacking one on top of another. And in doing that, they're gonna eclipse decades of break breakthroughs in scale and impact that we've seen in the last three or four decades that are gonna be dwarfed by this. There will be as much entrepreneurial uh, new creation of as there has been in the last century. With this high, uh, with this stacking of high bandwidth, uh, low cost communication, ubiquitous AI on the cloud, growing access to AI aided education and AI driven healthcare, we are digitizing goods and services, finance, insurance, education, entertainment, and demonetizing them and making them fully available to billions of people on mobile devices everywhere. If we can do that, think what we can do with healthcare, water and food security, sustainable capitalism, cybersecurity, or climate. And that's just to name but a few. 
So what are a few more of these outsized opportunities? Well, the environment, the stacking of material science, artificial intelligence, broadband networks will lead to investment in sustainability across the natural ecosystem in food, water, animals in the wild, forests and insects, fungi and bacteria. And that in turn will lead to breakthroughs in healthcare and a lot of other fields. Energy, the stacking of advancements in solar, wind, geothermal, hydroelectric, nuclear and localized grids will drive humanity towards cheap, abundant and ubiquitous renewable energy and will drive the price of renewables below one cent per kilowatt hour and storage below three cents. When that happens, things are going to get exponentially larger. Agriculture, the stacking of biotechnology, material science, machine learning, and ag tech, we can develop ethical, nutritious, and environmentally sustainable protein production. With the creation of stem cell-based cellular agriculture, that will allow for production of beef, chicken, and fish anywhere on demand, probably in the next decade. Health, the stacking of genome sequencing, CRISPR technologies, AI, quantum computing, and cellular medicine can put game-changing biotech and pharmaceutical solutions in reach of consumers this decade, potentially adding a decade to the human lifespan. Cobots. With AI as a service, platforms will develop allowing humans to partner with AI in every aspect of work at every level in every industry. AIs are going to serve as cognitive collaborators to all of us entrepreneurs, corporate executives, employees, gig workers, everyone. And this partnership will become a requirement. For example, in the future, making certain diagnosis without the consultation of AI may be deemed malpractice or starting a business without an AI, AI co-founder might be unthinkable. Humans and, and robots, AI, machine learning together are way more powerful than either one by itself. And this is the way the future is, is heading already. Smart, the stacking of, uh, with the price of specialized machine learning uh, dropping rapidly uh, with the rise in global demand, there's gonna be a combined, and that's combined with low cost microscopic sensors and the deployment of high bandwidth networks. This will make every device intelligent. And when every device is smart, the possibilities become exponential. And this one, this, I say please on this because this one has the opportunity to potentially get rid of advertising as we know it. When you stack machine learning, sensors, augmented reality, and 5G networks, that can lead to the disruption of advertising and a chance to return to data privacy. As a result, the advertising industry, which competes for our attention and gathers our data, will have a hard time influencing our AI collaborators or gathering our data. And this is something that would be a welcome relief, I think, to all of us. Now, we're going to need capital to do this. And the good news is that with global connectivity, dematerialization, demonetization, and democratization, humanity hit an all time high in global flow of seed capital, venture capital, and sovereign wealth fund investments this decade. This trend is going to continue that upward trajectory. And with that kind of capital abundance, it's going to lead to some crazy sort of 1999 entrepreneurial ideas which we need now more than ever to solve these complex problems and to accelerate innovation. There's gonna be 300 billion in crowdfunding anticipated uh, available to the marketplace by 2025, a massive democratization of access to capital for entrepreneurs worldwide. This could be a game changer. Uh, and then channeling capital into investment vehicles for cities uh, and towns to invest in entrepreneurs and ecosystems and change the way economic development works inside cities uh, in America can make an enormous difference in the creation of jobs uh, that we're gonna need uh, in this new world we're headed towards. So with ex exponential entrepreneurship, we can imagine more, we can create more, we can build for resiliency and adaptation and sustainability. So when things like COVID come along, and they will come along far more often than every hundred years. In fact, a study last year showed that there is a one month interruption in business regionally in the United States every 3.7 years. This is gonna become business as usual. And we can, we can build for that. We can form a sustainable economic system. If innovators, entrepreneurs and corporate ingenuity can leverage the exceptional power of these stacking technologies, and can positively manage the change, the change that that's going to bring, we can create a new, better future for ourselves, for our country, and for our world. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Michael. We appreciate it. And alumni, so you know there'll be time uh, for question and answer uh, Q and A after our next presenter, who is Rodney DeSouza. And are you there, Rodney? Sure am. I'm good to go. Good to go, Rodney. All right. Awesome. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Michael, thank you for that uh, scary yet exciting uh, introduction to, uh, to innovation and, and entrepreneurship. Um, my name is Rodney D'Souza, uh, and I'm the Managing Director for the Institute for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at TCU. I'm also a faculty member in the Department of Entrepreneurship uh, at the Neely School of Business. Um, so in my day job, uh, I work with startups, uh, with investors, and building entrepreneurial ecosystems. And you know, for, for innovation to work in a startup, you need three sort of broad uh, but basic ingredients. So you need talent, uh, you need money, and you need a supportive ecosystem. And uh, corporations are no different, right? So uh, for innovation to work uh, within a corporation, there too, you need talent, you need money, uh, and you need a workspace that not only allows innovation uh, but actually embraces it, right? And embraces every aspect of it from the top down. And um, while, you know, we'll cover different aspects of culture and team and, and things like that in, in the upcoming program, um, what I'd like to talk a little bit about today, following Michael, is how innovation is actually funded, right? So uh, we have all this great technology, we've got all this great innovation, how do companies, big and small, sort of um, use resources and use uh, what they have to actually fund innovation and create new products and services. Now, keep in mind, today's managers are in a very unique position, right? Where they have multiple channels uh, to help their firms be innovative. Uh, they can work on commercialization, <clears throat> excuse me, of uh, internal uh, IP or R&D uh, through things such as like the innovation labs, incubators, um, partnerships with existing accelerator programs, and a lot of these firms are now starting their own investment arms, right? So uh, corporate VC is a big thing that's also growing. Now, you know, all these things require money and there's different investment theses and strategies uh, based on the path that the company decides to go down. Um, but, you know, what we'll do is we'll talk about just a few of them right now and then um, sort of expand and, and uh, move on to the, uh, to the next things later down. So, you know, first, for example, companies like Lowe's, uh, they've got very successful lab programs where they take their technology and implement it not only in stores in the U.S. and, uh, and, around, the, and, uh, and around the world, but also uh, aboard the International Space Station, right? Um, similarly, you have uh, P&G uh, that has uh, multiple innovation labs where they handpick individuals uh, from, from PNG to tinker with PNG's internal uh, R&D and IP. Now, financing uh, for those labs um, are provided largely by funds set up specifically for and managed by internal managers uh, who play the role of VCs. So they'll check things like milestones, KPIs that are being implemented, um, and release funds uh, you know, accordingly uh, as and when different milestones are reached. Now, second, but a slightly sort of different take on the in internal innovation lab or the incubator program is partnerships with existing accelerators, right? So for example, Techstars. So companies like Sprint and Target, uh, they partner with accelerators and they have uh, sort of either their own internal uh, companies and ideas uh, go through the program or they use the, this whole program as a nursery uh, where they get front row seats uh, to external startups, right? That are going through the program. Um, and funding for that is usually given in terms of sort of grants uh, or really early stage investment to, to the companies going through uh, the accelerator. Now, uh, a third type of innovation funding, uh, you have companies like Google and Intel and Salesforce uh, who will set up their own multi-million or sometimes billion dollar funds, right? With a sole focus of identifying and acquiring uh, and growing external startups. Now, what this does is it gives uh, the, the large corporations access not just to technology, 
but also to teams so they can bring those really uh, talented teams uh, into their, their, own, uh, their own company. Now, popular examples of these, uh, and you probably heard of a lot of them are like uh, the Dollar Shave Club uh, with, with Unilever. Uh, you have uh, WhatsApp and Instagram uh, with Facebook uh, and things like that too. Now, like Michael had mentioned, you know, there's a huge increase in the availability of funding, right? And corporate venture capital is no different. If you look at it, uh, it's rocketed to almost 400% in the past decade. And now almost every Fortune 100 firm either has their own VC fund uh, or they're partnering with existing VC funds, right? And using them as sort of a VC as a service. Uh, because if they don't have the um, talent internally to run their own VC fund, they can go out and sort of hire that too. Now, uh, last but certainly not ne uh, least is uh, another way to finance innovation, uh, and Michael briefly touched upon this, is by way of crowdfunding, right? So companies like Tesla and Apple, uh, they're freaking masters of this methodology, right? When you have individuals like you and me prepay for products like the Tesla truck, uh, it gives the company resources, uh, you know, time uh, to continue developing uh, their prototypes and, and uh, innovation, figure out manufacturing, uh, and work out all the kinks necessary before we can actually go and try out that truck, right, or try out that phone and things like that. Now, keep in mind, these are all sort of examples of large uh, corporations that have access to a lot more money than small and medium-sized ones do. But small and medium-sized firms are, are pretty similar uh, when it comes to issues of you know, coming up with funding for their innovation, right? So a recent study of uh, small to medium-sized business owners in the US uh, found that more than 60% of them never even applied for funding to support innovation at all, right? That was completely foreign to them because that was like, that's not what we do, right? And there are a number of different government-funded programs like the SBIR and STTR uh, that are specifically designed uh, to increase innovation uh, in small and medium-sized companies. And these are grants given to, to uh, corporations by the, the federal government, and you don't give up equity, you don't have to pay it back, nothing, right? It's like all sort of free money per se. Now, you also have organizations that partner uh, with small and medium-sized businesses to help with the innovation. Um, and then those are more popular in Europe but we're starting to see uh, some of this uh, sort of model take root here in the US as well. So a recent example uh, where an accelerator, a uh, university and local government uh, came together and teamed up and they created a, a small to medium sized accelerator in Detroit. Um, and it's called Industry 4 Accelerator. And um, basically what they do is they give, um, you know, businesses who are accepted into the program um, access to direct investment uh, and more importantly, mentoring, right? So there are multiple sources of funding for innovation, uh, both for big, small, and medium-sized corporations. And again, you know, it, it all depends on sort of how those corporations juggle investment in innovation. And it's not easy, right? I mean, you have to consider factors like securing near-term revenue, um, you know, reducing costs, managing cash flows, uh, maintaining liquidity, and above all, shareholder value, right? Um, so uh, that's something that we'll be talking a lot about uh, in the program that uh, Jim will be uh, sort of um, building on in, in a little bit. Um, and, uh, so, you know, all sort of different approaches that these companies take in identifying uh, and building certain ideas uh, and innovation and the types of funding that might work uh, best for each other. Uh, so um, I'm going to hand it over to Peggy and to Jim. Rodney, thank you so much, and Michael as well. Um, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Jim Roach, uh, and my team and I are responsible for non-degree executive education at the Neely School, and with apologies to Daniel, I always tell everybody that I have the best job in the business school, because my role is to introduce our great faculty like Michael and Rodney and others to area businesses and leaders, and we build programs for companies like Lockheed Martin, BNSF, Cook Children's, JPS, and many others. And, we also deliver programs uh, on an open enrollment basis on topics like adaptive leadership and executive presence. Uh, right now, what we'd like to do is give you an opportunity to ask questions of both Michael and Rodney, and we're gonna do that in two ways. You absolutely can use the chat function and uh, submit your question there, and Peggy's gonna monitor that for us. Um, you are also very welcome to unmute and ask a question. Just please let us know um, who you wanna direct that to, and uh, we'll take it from there. So that said, uh, We'll take volunteers uh, for questions from Michael and Rodney. 
please direct all questions to Michael. <laughs> I'm going to raise my hand. Uh, did I did I hear something about a uh, fund that was going to be uh, uh, set up for entrepreneurship? For I'm sorry for uh, for entrepreneurs where um, the university or a private entity would put money into startups. Straight to you, Rodney. <laughs> um, who who asked that question, Jim? So I can I can uh, answer. James. It looks like James. Hi, hi, James. Yes, uh, we are working on uh, launching a um, alumni network fund. Uh, so basically, we are looking at ways to get um, TCU alumni involved and engaged in what's going on at TCU, and at the same time, have a really uh, cool opportunity for our students, right, who are being trained in classes by uh, Michael Sherrod and others, <clears throat> sort of how uh, investing works. So what we'll be doing is launching a uh, fund um, in the in the beginning of uh, this this coming year, uh, where we'll be um, sort of working with not just individuals from the community locally, but also alumni, uh, TCU alumni from from around the country, uh, bring them in, getting them involved and engaged in a way that says here's access to deal source um, of companies that have been vetted by our students, uh, here's due diligence documents done by our students. Um, and these are sort of uh, deals that you have access to for investing. I had heard of a local fund <clears throat> in the past. I've worked with Tech Fort Worth uh, over the past decade and a half. And I thought they had a Fort Worth uh, Angels or some angel group that they had worked with. I didn't know if they were still around or not. They are, James. So it's called the Cowtown Angels. Cowtown, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and they, uh, they, they still are around, yes. So I'm just saying that they, they may be a good model to uh, model off of if they've been successful. Yes, James. So we, we've got uh, individuals from the Cowtown. Actually, Michael was a forming member of the Cowtown Angels. Oh, cool, <laughs> Michael. So, so we've got the best. <laughs> I've known Darlene before she retired for years. Rodney, thank you so much. I'm, I'm looking at the chat window. I don't see any questions there. So let me go back out to the audience and see if we have any questions. And uh, Rodney is still hoping questions go to Michael, but uh, either one is fair game. Well, I don't know if I've heard it, an NBA like quiet, so. Uh, I'm, I'm going to step in and ask you a question. This is fairness for Rodney. How's that? You, uh, we, you and I have had a chance to speak uh, about a number of the challenges for organizations as they consider the innovation imperative. But could you speak to some specific challenges for leaders and the, the mindset leaders have need to have to, to take advantage of some of these entrepreneurial opportunities? Is that for me or for Rodney? That one was for you. I, I told Rodney I would ask you a question. Well, um, specific uh, as opposed to my presentation or as integrated with my so yeah absolutely so um there's a question i'll answer this as well that this came up on chat about the source of my information well the source of my information comes from a lot of places uh a lot of it comes from singularity university uh where P peter diamandis uh, the creator of the x prize and founder of singularity uh he believes in uh the abundance future and uh so some of the things came out of there some of the charts on exponential uh, uh, technologies came from all over, um, you know, reading a lot and pulling all that stuff together. Uh, and then some of the early uh, information came from uh, a whole host of studies that have been done and research that's been done over the last uh, four or five years, uh, including up until just the last couple of months. So, um, and to answer your question, Jim, in every one of those areas that I mentioned, healthcare, um, uh, energy, uh, agriculture, all of those things. You stack the technology. What happens, a lot, of, a lot of companies and entrepreneurs only look at one or two technologies that they're going to innovate in. And um, so unfortunately, there's a lot more to look at. 
And a lot of smaller companies don't really look at AI or machine learning as much as they should. The, the costs of that are not anywhere near what people think. And uh, machine learning is just pouring data into a, a, a computer essentially that has been taught to learn. So instead of programming it like we do with code, you program it with data and rules for a game or whatever, and it learns how to do that. The more data it gets, the more it learns. And then it continues to learn and that's what makes it smart. So um, the opportunities exist in almost every industry that I can think of to utilize those tools uh, to create more opportunity uh, and even potentially exponential opportunity for large companies as well as small companies. Now, this takes a lot of work. This is not easy. Um, about 75% of all global companies have engaged in machine learning or AI projects. The problem is only about 17% of their executives actually understand it. So what's happening is, is that they're out there doing all these projects and all this learning and data is happening. And they're sort of creating a future for us, whether we want them to or not. And they don't really understand what they're doing uh, in the process. So we all need to kind of get in there and learn a little bit more so that we can engage with those technologies. And I think almost within the next decade, if you're gonna remain uh, economically viable as a business, you're gonna to have to engage in these things to some degree. And there will be companies that will bring the price down and make it available to just about everybody, especially entrepreneurs will be uh, getting into these fields and finding new ways for them to be used. So no matter where you're looking, if you take AI and you stack material science on top of that and you, and you uh, stack uh, low cost communications on top of that. And you, you stack sensors in 5G that are all around us that can create instant computing and instant little databases for us to, to utilize. That's just going to blow open a lot of opportunity for everybody. Um, and in every field, there's a different set of technologies, but they're all, they're all capable of being stacked one on top of another. It sort of redefines the tech stack in a way. Um, and uh, it's going to just make a tremendous difference in our ability to solve problems uh, and our ability to even take on some of these big, complex problems that we, we really haven't been able to do heretofore. Michael, thank you. And I can see a number of questions coming up in the chat. You probably can see them as well. But I see that Jeffrey Chapman is actually asking a follow-up question to this. And for those of us who may not be up to speed in regard to AI, where would you suggest beginning research and learning on that topic? Well, there are right now, there are a number of courses uh, available in like Coursera or Udacity or some of these other uh, 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 MOOC kind of classes, uh, online classes for very little money. You can learn everything you need to know about every aspect of AI. You know, there are literally five different areas. There's RSA, there's machine learning, then there's a couple of levels of AI itself. Uh, and you can learn about every single one of them. And it's not as hard, you know, we're, we're, it's sort of like Zoom. Very few of us used Zoom before uh, COVID uh, and now almost all of us use it and, and we become used to the technology. It's gonna be the same thing with AI. As soon as you get in there and you start using it, it becomes, oh, this isn't that hard. And you begin to see all of the applications that you can put into it. So that makes for um, a really, I think, vibrant uh, atmosphere, but you've got to go learn it. It's not something that's going to come to you anytime soon. Uh, it may be brought to you in five years by another company that you can engage to do it for you. But now, right now, you need to learn it yourself. And everybody should. It's sort of like data analytics. We're all data analysts now. We all need to understand how that works. Uh, and with AI, it's not that complicated. And when you get in there and just learn a little bit, you suddenly realize wow, machine learning can totally transform my business. RSA, for instance, where you, you're basically automating robots to do tasks like answer email, that sort of thing, just a, a lot of simple business tasks, that, that is already out there uh, impacting the, uh, the, uh, the knowledge worker around the world. And <clears throat> we're going to need uh, a lot of retraining and training, and that's going to become part and parcel of our lives. I think training is going to be one of the biggest opportunities in the 21st century. It's cert certainly until the mid-21st mid, mid, mid 21st century. Great. Michael, I'm looking at the list of questions and I think, I think so far Rodney's off the hook. It, it may, may come back around. I see a question here from Eric. Um, with the influx of capital- 
I'm sorry, my five. Um, from Eric says here with the uh, influx of capital to innovation and disruption, what do you think will be the biggest constraint to young generations innovating today? Well, I, I think the, the biggest uh, issue will be uh, the constraints put on them by their employers. Um, every corporation has massive constraints built in. Um, in my experience of creating companies inside larger companies, the number of constraints is almost unbelievable. You have political restraints, you have budgeting constraints, you have HR constraints, you have you know, constraints that come from people saying we can't do that or we tried that five years ago and it didn't work. Uh, you have constraints coming from your peers. If, if your boss gives you $5 million to go create something, every other manager on your level is going to be upset. They're going to be like, what, you gave Michael $5 million? You give that to me, I'll make money. He's just going to flush it down the toilet. So, you know, so then suddenly you have a big target on your back because you're an innovator and they'll badmouth you to the, the C-suite all the time. So, uh, you one word of advice, if you are starting something inside a large company, get out of the main building, go somewhere else where nobody can see you and sort of be able to develop the company on the side. Um, so that's going to be a constraint. If you're outside a company and you, you want to get uh, some, some of that big capital that's out there, the, the biggest problem you're going to have is finding the right investors and uh, convincing them that you have the experience and the know-how uh, to build what you're going to build. The, the number one thing that a lot of investors look at is can this team take this idea and make it work? Um, and if they don't have confidence in the team, they're not going to do it because you, you have to understand that an investor wants to look at a team and know that they're going to be able to pivot. They're going to be able to figure this out one way or another. And, uh, and if you have confidence in that, you're going to do that. Now, Frankly, there's so much capital out there that younger people have, have an opportunity to go get it now because everybody's looking for places to put their money that's going to give them a better return than any other kind of investment. Um, and, you know, small business is a great investment. It, you're not going to get 30x, but you're going to get a, a continual rise in business uh, as opposed to a, a tech startup that wants to grow super fast. Um, you know, Silicon Valley's model is built for just exceptions. It fails about 97% of the time over a four year period. Just starting a small company succeeds about 50% of the time over a four year period. So, you know, investors are looking for different opportunities and the financing world is changing to meet these needs. Uh, you're now getting more debt equity that's coming into the marketplace than just pure uh, uh, speculative equity. Uh, you're getting more kinds of financial models to uh, support small companies and new companies that are sort of rising up uh, to figure out a better way to get more success out of investments. Uh, so there's a lot going on that I think is going to make a lot of difference, particularly for, for young uh, entrepreneurs. And then of course, crowdfunding. If you've got a good, a, a good product or you can put out there and get people excited about uh, contributing to that, you can raise a whole lot of money. I think the record on Kickstarter is 22 million. Think about that. $22 million in non-equity funding. That is mind boggling. That's free money. It's just an unbelievable resource. And if you can get in there with something that's, that people really want, you can, you can take off. I think Michael, what you're talking about was the, the recipe for potato salad, right? Wasn't that $22 million on Kickstarter? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that was $2 and, and 50 cents. That's great. Um, so if I could add really quick to uh, what Michael just said about uh, sort of the, uh, you know, barriers to innovation, um, one could also be the end user or the customer, right? And if they're actually ready for such innovation. Uh, so like the example that Michael talked about as Zoom, um, not many of us used Zoom before COVID because we didn't really like how the interaction was, right? Um, that we wanted that face-to-face, -face. we'd rather do something else but now we're all forced to use it. So it's like a behavioral change, right? And we realize it's not too bad, right? It's a great innovation because it allows us to do a lot of the stuff that we couldn't do before. Um, similarly, you look at, you know, automobiles too, right? So uh, moving over from gas to electric, um, it's, a, it's a good innovation, but getting people to switch over is it's problematic because a lot of the behaviors that need to change in people's minds um, as new innovation comes along. Uh, so those are, 
certain things too that you know we've got to sort of always keep in the back of our mind as the end user or the customer and how they're going to react to innovation. Rodney and Michael, thank you so much. Um, I think we've run out of time for questions at least this afternoon, but I really appreciate both your perspectives on this. Um, I get the privilege of kind of bringing us home here and to Dean Cohen's um, thought earlier about innovation and lifelong learning opportunities. Just want to share uh, something that the Neely School has put together. Uh, we are very excited to tell you that uh, we're going to continue this conversation with a new program. It's an advanced leadership certificate program that will begin in January. Michael and Rodney are going to lead a good portion of that for us, along with some of our other outstanding faculty. Um, this program is focused on exactly this conversation. How do we help leaders and organizations think about how do you lead when you're faced with continuous transformation? What is required uh, from a business model perspective, from a strategy perspective? How do you have to rethink how you lead teams and you lead organizations? Um, we're excited about this. It is um, also uh, innovative in instruction. Um, it's a little longer than some of our other non-degree programs, but it's also uh, much more immersive. It's a 16-week program. It will begin in January and run through May. And we've structured it around four in-person days. Those days are, are about once every four or five weeks over that course of the 16-week program. Uh, they were led by some of our best faculty as we start. Michael's going to kick that off uh, and, and continue this discussion about what's the environment, why is innovation imperative, and, and what does it look like to lead in continuous transformation. Um, as we go through the in-person days, the second one is in February. That's going to be led by Mark Houston and Lance Betancourt, two of our wonderful faculty, and that's centered on customer-centric innovation and techniques to do that. As we look at the third in-person day, that's going to be in April. Uh, Rodney's going to start that and continue the discussion around how do you fund and nurture uh, new ventures, uh, either from startups or in larger organizations. Suzanne Carter is actually going to fill out that day. She leads, as many of you know, our EMBA program and talk about um, building value for multiple stakeholders. How do we create shared value in enterprises? The last in-person day of these four pillars uh, is in May. Mary Bean will lead that. Mary is an exceptional faculty um, and researcher and has done a lot of work around leading in complexity. And she's gonna talk about how do you lead the organization of the future? Um, all in all, you can see that this program is really centered around how do we build truly adaptive organizations? You can see some other features on here. In between those one, one excuse me, one uh, day programs, one every four or five weeks, we have uh, virtual sessions. Those will be also led by our faculty and outside presenters. Um, it's also going to include three virtual application workshops along the way. Mary is going to lead by um, how can we take these concepts, the tip that Michael, Rodney, and other faculty deliver to you, and how do you apply them to what you have on your desk right in front of you? And we're going to build that into the program. In fact, all of our programs are really application focused. How can you take what you learn on a Monday and apply it on a Tuesday? The last feature of this program, um, aside from the in-person and virtual sessions, when the program is done in May, we're gonna ask and, and offer a way for you to continue to be connected to both the cohort and our wonderful faculty. So once a quarter after the program is done, we're gonna get everybody back together and live talk about the challenges you have. You can hear uh, and get advice from our faculty. You can hear from the, your peers in the cohort. And we're gonna create a way to build that network so as you try to manage through this environment, You'll get our help and help from the cohort. The last thing I'll say about this, you can see on the right side of the page are some of the topics. So we'll talk about organizations in the age of continuous improvement. Um, Brian A. Link, who is senior VP at Capital One, will be with us to talk about case studies and business transformation. How did Capital One and all our organizations complete a digital transformation? What were the success factors as they looked at that? We'll talk about business ecosystems and innovation. Uh, funding and nurturing new ventures, as I mentioned. Um, we were, we're very fortunate to have Michael Arena with us. He's going to talk about leading the future of work. Michael is the Chief Talent Development Officer for AWS, and he's going to lead that segment. That's a virtual segment. And again, Mary's going to, to finish up by uh, really the last day talking about how do we lead the future of work, lead this future organization, and build that together. So I'm going to pause there, um, and we're very excited about the program. If anybody has any questions on that, I'd be glad to answer them now. And Jim, you might point out that I posted in the chat that our alumni receive a 10% discount on um, that program. And there's a link where people can register. So check your chat box for that. Thank you. Thank you for that. We really appreciate that. And uh, uh, if anyone has any questions, you can always mail me directly. I'd be glad to kind of walk you through this. We're, we're very excited about it. You can see we've 
pulled together a lot of the, the strengths of the Neely School, both in terms of our wonderful faculty and our network to put together uh, what we think is a really robust and impactful program. So with that, Peggy, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Okay, thank you so much. And I know we're close to our stop time and that everyone is uh, busy professionals and you need to get going. Just a couple quick housekeeping items. Uh, one this afternoon, you're gonna receive a brief survey from me. We'll only take a second, but it'll help us build future experiences like this. We wanna hear from you about the format and the content and things that you would like to hear from. So if you will take um, just a few minutes and complete that survey, it'd be fantastic. And then also you'll um, be notified that we are looking for volunteers to serve in some alumni focus groups. We wanna hear from you and um, develop programs that better serve your needs. So if you're interested in volunteering for a focus group, please email me at p.conway at tcu.edu. So with that, thank you all for joining us. It was a real pleasure. I know I didn't get to see a lot of you, but it was fun to see names and really looking forward to working with you in the future. Have a great afternoon. Bye.